Hello, hello, hello. All right, I am live. Coming to you live and direct. This is Mr. Mick. <laughs> so it's been a while since I did a just straight up art lesson. Um, uh, it's low light. This, this camera, I'm realizing it's like in somewhat low lighting set settings and situations. All of a sudden, it kind of turns into like a really fuzzy bad webcam. I think when the lighting's good, um, it's not that big of an issue. Uh, actually, let me do this real quick. I need to bring the, um, oh, here we go. Let me bring this here. There we go. Okay. I don't know if people use that or not. I love it. Uh, the multiple desktops in, <laughs> in Windows. Um, that used to be something that kept me coming back to Linux. Uh, if anybody is into Linux at all, the Linux operating system. Um, all right, so we're gonna be using we use the iPad today. Here's a self portrait I've been working on with my um, my juniors, uh, and we, we started that with a grid. So it, this is me taking the picture uh, a few weeks ago, um, you know, just before the students went out on uh, on spring break, but just to give them an idea of how you do this. And I was like, no, I'm just gonna take a goofy picture here with the webcam. And then um, I used the grid to get the drawing down um, of the picture. And then I took this other drawing that I had done that was in a show last year in Mount Holly. And I, um, I combined the two together. And combining the two together has reminded me a lot of other stuff that I work on in terms of art. So it's, there's a reason that I did that, um, even though I didn't consciously intend it. So there's no um, comments and stuff here. I am toying with the idea of creating a, a Discord for my online, for my students, but also for other people that come across this stuff. Uh, my, my class is here and want to participate, whether it be like the gaming side of thing and the gadget side of things, or more of like the, the, the um, drawing and art side of things, that there's, uh, and I, I would probably need, um, for students of mine that are watching this, uh, I'm thinking of someone like Samira, I would probably need, or Maya, or Hannah. <laughs> I would probably need moderate. Notice I said all, all, all of the girls in my class, <laughs> in my junior class. Um, no, I, I'm sure Deshaun and Arsenia would be good moderators. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what is this that you're doing, Mr. Mick? Um, did I, what did I name this, this drawing? <laughs> oh, okay. So I'm going to cha eventually change the name of this stream because uh, that's not right. I'm not doing that. What we're doing is we're not drawing a pencil from any angle. What we're doing is I have this uh, thing that I used to do when I was um, a student um, in high school. Um, and I don't know where I got this idea from. I might have, this is before the, the internet existed, but it wasn't like, like a really big deal. And I apologize, like my hair is just, yes, it's amazing. Um, you know, before the, you know, back in like the nineties. So, so I graduated high school. I was supposed to graduate in 1997, but I ended up graduating high school in 98. Um, so, <clears throat> Uh, so we're looking at like, you know, this is like 1995. Um, yeah, I'm doing this 96, maybe, maybe even 97. So while I'm in high school, 98, um, this actually is probably more like 97 and 98 that I did this. I was doing this kind of a thing. Um, but what I would do, and I'm going to keep working on this one, but, uh, I want to show you how I start this process and you can make your own. So you just start with a piece of paper. So you don't need to have a fancy drawing tablet and pencil and all this stuff. You know, a piece of paper is fine. And I'm going to try to treat this as if it were a piece of paper. Um, I just had time. I was just messing around with my 3D printers. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to, I'm going to close my eyes. And I'm going to draw, kind of lightly draw a bunch of lines. I hope this is actually working because it's tough for me to see. 
Yeah, that works. Okay. I'm trying not... When I, why have my eyes closed? Because I'm trying not to influence what I draw. Um, the shapes and stuff that I draw. Because I feel like... Okay, that's pretty good. Now, I've just made a bunch of lines. Those lines have intersected each other and they've made shapes. Um, now, what you do is you start looking around in these shapes. You know, you might flip it this way. So, so right here, I'm definitely seeing, I don't know if you're seeing this, but I'm seeing like an, an eye and like a nose, right? Now, I'm sort of drawing through shapes there, you know, but that's fine. It's kind of, this guy kind of reminds me, eh, his nose is a little too big, but he kind of reminds me of my friend uh, when I grew up, Will. Uh, okay. So, so all of a sudden there's a face, right? And I could keep, I could keep working on that or I could say like, you know, I, I could even start, I could even start and connect like this into this, right? And maybe I can even continue this, this nose kind of loops back into that, right? So it's just, um, you know, and, and you could work on that a bit. It doesn't have to become a whole scene. You know, I think some artists would take this and all of a sudden it becomes like some sort of fancy figurative scene. And that's, that's well and good. Um, but I'm saying, I'm just interested in grabbing onto different things, you know? It can be even that you just start, you just start saying like, I kind of am interested in that shape. And then what, what happens here um, is I'm using some of the elements of perspective. And if you're like, what are you talking about, Mr. Mick? Elements perspective, go back and look at previous videos of mine. But there's seven elements of perspective um, the seven elements of perspective, and if I can do the shorthand, let's see if I can remember. How well do you really know this, Mr. Mick? You've been teaching it for years. Okay, first one, surface, right? So, surface. You move things to the bottom of the page. Both, both apples are the same size. One's just towards the bottom of the page. It feels like it's closer. Uh, we have size, right? This one's bigger. This one's further away, or this one's smaller. It feels like one's closer. The bigger one's closer to us. Two of the elements. One, two. Uh, An other element. Um, well, one that we use that you know lots of people I think even know the symbol. It's overlap. Uh, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna change the way that I do that one. Boom, boom. Overlap. I'm gonna do it like this. Right, one, one apple or one ball is in front of the other. The one that's closer to us is the one that sort of feels like, well, it's overlapping. All right, if you could draw through and see through, we could see that, but we can't because it's overlapped, right? So we get that overlap. Oftentimes, overlap is also expressed in that kind of a way. You know, one line, like this line would continue if this line didn't cut it off, right? Um, so overlap, those are three. Oh, okay, so foreshortening is an easy one. Uh, that's, you know, we're not looking at the thing from above, we're looking at it from the side at an angle. So that's uh, foreshorten. Um, that's four, three more to go. We have this, all right, we have shading. Don't make me throw shade at it. Put some shade on it. <laughs> we have this, which is surface lines. Lines. That's six. And the last but not least, we have density. So as things move away, they are drawn sort of lighter and with less detail. And things get closer, they have kind of heavier, sharper lines and more detail. There's our seven elements of perspective. That is everything you need to learn 
or need to know, to master, to create the sense of visual space, right? So here was just this random shape, and I was like, well, let me find, because we can kind of imagine here that this, there's some overlap going on there, right? Uh, we can see some shading that happens here. We could put, well, not happens, but we can put it in. Uh, we could put some surface lines here, you know? We might even find a surface line here and, and cut a piece out of that. So all of a sudden, there's a hole missing out of that one. And, and I don't want to get too, this kind of looks like a little like mini putt-putt golf course kind of feel to me. Um, what other elements, you know? Uh, so we can find some overlap, we can find some um, foreshortening in that, because you know basically if we think about this, we can think of this as kind of a foreshortened, a couple of foreshortened shapes. Right, so foreshortening is implicit. Um, it's implied. Um, okay, so that's kind of the process, right? So I started this earlier with my students, and and one of my goals, you know, I have lots of like little to do lists and stuff that I, I try to like work on things, and I, you know, I'm I'm really into something called. CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. I think it's just great. Um, and um, it really can uh, <clears throat> um, make you aware of your own thought process. And um, the, the cool thing about this to-do list is I have a column of like how much time I think it's going to take me, how difficult I think it's going to be, and how satisfied I'm going to be having done the thing, right? So the point of that is um, a lot of times you make assumptions about how hard something's gonna be and when you you write down, okay, I think it's gonna be this hard and then you go and do it. And then afterwards you check back and you're like, well, it was actually, if I was to say on like a scale of one to 10, how hard that is, it was more, I thought it was gonna be like a nine and a half or like a 10 or 11, but it ended up being like a three. So maybe, maybe there's a part of us that always kind of is worried about what might happen, you know? And um, <clears throat> so this, this process, and actually I can play back the video from this from earlier. So you can see here, I'm gonna start and play it. Um, you can see I start with just those random shapes, just like I did uh, with those random lines. I close my eyes and I built it. I think I put a gray background. I keep stopping and rewinding so it doesn't get too far. I think I can stop by holding my finger on it. No, I can't. Okay, um, I put a gray background on it. Um, you can just start with a gray piece of paper or you can just do this on regular paper or just smudge a little bit. And then um, what I did here was I just took that first shape and kind of repeated that shape below it in order to give that sense of a uh, of a shadow being cast down. Um, and the shape itself kind of gave me the feeling that it was kind of foreshortened a little bit. And then I started thinking about this whole example as being a kind of a puzzle. Like it kind of looks like a puzzle, you know? So then I thought, well, what if the shadow is underneath and that's one puzzle piece that sort of lifted off, like, like, like lifted out, you know? Um, and then I was just experimenting with the shadow. So, so I'm using those elements of perspective that I know to create that illusion of 3D space to just experiment and have fun. And I am sure, you know, it's funny, I was thinking about MC Escher. Um, I was thinking about MC Escher's work last night. And I was thinking, you know, a lot of people, they look at me, me myself too. When you look at, and, and for people who don't know the work of MC Escher, I was working on cave paintings earlier with my students, MC Escher. So if we're looking at, uh, Escher does these, these really interesting, um, and oftentimes these things were etched. <laughs> he was an amazing, amazing uh, craftsman. And some artists, uh, there's a part of being an artist that is a, being a craftsman that is part of making something well. Um, so lots, so a number of artists will, they'll build their own, uh, they might paint on a, 
don't know if you can see it back there. Yeah, a little bit. You can see a painting I made um, years ago, and I've been, you know, during quarantine thinking about working on. Um, but that painting, I, you know, got pieces of wood. They were specifically cut for paintings, but I took the pieces of wood and I pushed them together to the size that I, you know, it was based on the size that I wanted to make it. And then I had to staple or screw it. I can't remember. I had to put, you know, I had to build supports. I had to build the whole structure of the frame and then stretch the canvas over it. And when you're doing that kind of a thing, when you're preparing, uh, when you're preparing a canvas and stuff in that way, you get a feel for the craftsmanship that goes into this. You know, years ago, artists would grind their own paint. Um, they would, uh, you know, study with different masters to learn different techniques. They would they would experiment with different chemicals and different materials in order to blend their paints and to add varnishes to their paints. So there was a side of this which was kind of experimentation and, and craftsmanship as well as the creative art side of things. It, was, it wasn't, and I don't, I don't think it was different. I think those parts live together. Now, looking at Escher's work here, I realize part of what makes his thing work so well is he's using a kind of isomeric, isometric perspective. And that's really a lot of, I, I've talked about Bruce McIntyre's work in the past, but, um, and, and his amazing work, but, but there's some illusions that go on with Escher's work, which is like you, if you imagine you can come this way and go this way and go this way and go this way and go this way, oh, there's usually some sort of an illusion in, yeah, okay, so this, this right here feels like, yeah, we feel like it's, it's this whole thing here where things, this whole thing, <laughs> I've been watching a lot of The Big Lebowski lately. Um, oh, thank you, Amazons. Subscribe. What? I better look into that. Subscribe and save. I don't know what I'm subscribed to. I got subscribed to Wet Wipes for like two years when I didn't need to be. And uh, I ended up with like two years worth of Wet Wipes that I have to slowly work through. Um, so... Yeah, there's... And, and what the visual puzzle here? The visual puzzle is... This is above this part, and it's also below it. It's above in the sense that if it's, if it's here, then this and this should be on the same level, right? But all of a sudden, this seems like it's going on top of that. So at one part, this thing is overlapping this, and another part, it, this is overlapping that, right? So within this perspective, there are some inherent... Um, flaws in the in the perspective well, in the sense that not that there's flaws because our brain reads this as like a very well articulated three-dimensional space but the flaw is the visual visual cue and and you can see this is kind of an example of how overlap and the elements perspective can be used to create this illusion of a three-dimensional surface. And I think that was the thing I was thinking about with Escher last night, is that the illusion isn't, this is, this is a pretty cool optical illusion, but the whole thing itself is an illusion because you're looking at a, every piece of art is an illusion. Because if you're looking at a piece of art from the standpoint of look at that beautiful landscape or seascape, it is paint on a canvas. That's all it is. The beauty of what's happening is not on the canvas. The beauty of what's happening is the fact that your mind can take this flat thing and create this, look and see a universe. The beauty is when you sit before a, a Pixar movie, you're staring at a flat screen. Animals don't get why we do it. I mean, the occasional animal will look and, and kind of look, you know, the cat will swipe at something. But for the most part, animals don't get it. But we do. And that's something that makes us human is that we can see in that thing an entire universe. And, 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 and Escher's playing a joke on us a little bit by saying there's, there's a problem here. And our brain goes, hey, there's a problem here. There's a problem. Some people might not even notice it. 
But some people who are paying attention to things go, wait, wait, oh, I see what you did there. Okay. But then there's another, I think, another level to it, which is, what's he, why is, what is he, is it, is it just, a joke can just be a joke, but oftentimes, like, if you listen to great comedians, and I think uh, certain comedians are really just great thinkers, um, their jokes often have a have a truth to them and a reality to them. And they might even be pointing to something that exists within society that we should all be thinking about. And they're kind of a little bit ahead of the curve. And the way that they're letting us know is through humor so we don't get mad at them because they're just calling us stupid. <laughs> and some comedians, I think, do do that. Uh, they're a little contemptible about the average. Anyway, so... I am just taking the elements of perspective and using them here. Um, I'm using a kind of foreshortening in the, uh, there's a kind of foreshortening happen, happening with that puzzle piece because we're not looking at the puzzle piece, we're looking at it at an angle. Um, there's even foreshortening, for example, in that I cut that piece out up top here and I said, okay, well, I'm gonna leave it there. And I was experimenting with that. This kind of looks like, oh, I don't know, a day of the tentacle. There's like a video game or something. Um, I was just experimenting with just more overlap, more shading, some size there, some surface lines there. And uh, you come kind of going in the, I have no idea where this is going to go. Um, part of, and it can be like the last one where part of it, you know, it could be flip it upside down and see what I see. Maybe there's something different. Like I'm always seeing like butterfly wings or something so maybe this is like some sort of weird three-dimensional butterfly but I, I guess what what, I, what excites me so much about this type of work is that it is self-referential in the sense that I'm not looking at a thing to try to draw that thing um, if I find those things in this space then great um, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong to look at things and draw them. I'm just saying I like that with armed with nothing but a piece of paper and a pencil and maybe an eraser if you want it or maybe a shading stick if you want it. You have everything you need to practice the elements of perspective. You have everything you need to entertain yourself in, in ways. I, I don't know. I think there's something about this kind of thing. Uh, I know I, I tend to get um, very zealous about things. You know, I'm like, oh, this is just the greatest thing ever. This is the best way. Um, but I just think there's something about making art which uh, engages. I don't like that color. I'm going to grab this. I'm just going to make that a little bit lighter. <clears throat> there's something about making art which is um, just so unique. And I think I keep talking every time I stream. I think I talk about this, but you know, I just, I just keep. Uh, part of it is to say it to say it to all of you, or whoever's tuning into this or finds this eventually, you know, in the future, maybe even myself as I come back to it to remember. Um, but part of it is, um, I don't know. I just think there's something that's just so unique about creating, and and making. That um, and I think what happens is, is that we we beat up on our own potential, you know. Um, you know, I, I started this this uh, YouTube thing with the idea of helping people that are stuck at home during the quarantine, and and when I first started it. I had these kind of ideas that like I'm going to be attracting lots of you know students. My goal wasn't to um, become some popular YouTuber. I mean, I have a job already. <laughs> I'm an art teacher, um, but my but it was just to share with with people uh, the things that I well the, it really was like I'm to do what I wanted. What are you trying to say here, Mr. Mick, exactly? See, these, that's why I like the live format. Um, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I could I could be recording all of this like a, like a, uh, uh, my dad. 
I could be recording all of this like a um, like a, a commentary. So I don't. I could be commentating on top. And also, there's probably a little bit of a lag, like as I do things. Uh, this eventually gets more and more out of sync because I'm beaming my iPad to my laptop and well, you know, all the ways. I don't have a Mac, so I can't connect it directly because Macs are too expensive. <laughs> but I don't really need it, so. Um, what was I even just... I was saying that... Um, Why am I doing this? I, I just totally forgot what I was saying. <laughs> but I guess I had ideas that this channel would would um, take off more than it has. You know, I thought it would be bigger, uh, faster. I was like, man, I'm, I'm, you know, riding the wave here, you know? And the thing is, I mean, I've, um, you know, definitely created a lot of content. I have learned so much <laughs> in in terms of like reconnecting with the art spirit. You know, I used to read the book of, of Robert Henri and uh, I would do a little bit every day of that book because it was so, at a time in my life where I was first discovering the works of Emerson and Thoreau. And I know some of you, if you're like young, like first or second grade, like that kind of, you know, when you get older, check out Emerson Thoreau. But if you're like in middle school, all through high school, into your adulthood, and you haven't read Thoreau, and you haven't read Self-Reliance of Emerson, um, Nature by Emerson, Emerson uh, there's some great ideas and thoughts in that writing. Um which talks about the kind of nature of the individual to the state, you know? What are you talking about, Mr. Mick? You're getting into philosophy. This is a drawing lesson. I know. I'm just, you know, if you want to mute me, put on some whatever and just draw along with me. <laughs> or if you're not into this whole idea of, of just starting with shapes, um, is this a proper drawing lesson? Yeah. Because what are we doing? We're taking those elements of perspective and we are incorporating them and practicing them. We're practicing them like the way Alan Iverson must have practiced that crossover a million billion times. The way Steph Curry must practice that three-pointer a million billion times so it just comes naturally. But is it work when he's in the gym doing that? No, it's not work. He's just doing what... He enjoys. We do this. Those that do this don't do this because they do that. They, yeah, you, it's great to get cheered on by your friends and, and family and etc. And for people to appreciate your work. But that's not why you're doing it. And I could say, if you're not doing it for that reason, you're doing it for the wrong reason. This is just my opinion. And I might be wrong. I'm not saying that there's a wrong reason to do anything or a right reason to do anything. Whatever reason you come up with, that's your reason. But I'm just saying, um, <clears throat> I'm saying I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space. I could be bounded on a desert island with nothing but reams of paper and a pencil and I could find infinite things to draw, infinite creations to make. Uh, and I hope you feel the same way too. Now, um, I was also doing things before, which are things like that. <laughs> which, how would you do that? Well, one way you could do that is put your put your piece of paper under a um, a light box or like an iPad if you're on just using a pencil. Um, but the but you can. My point in that is that you can flip things. A couple of different ways and all of a sudden you're looking at things kind of reversed and upside down and that can be really cool you know now I'm looking at this I'm like okay all I see is that puzzle piece I don't think anything else fits into that <laughs> but what I could do is because I'm working digitally I could turn that layer off and now I'm back to my original thing and but let, let me let me 
I'm gonna make another shape here, work on another shape. You know, I kind of, there's something that's really interesting about this to me. Let's just stand, I, I put it on a new layer. Um, I didn't have to do that. And maybe, maybe we got something that's going on here. There's uh, one of the examples that often in uh, McIntyre uses to get at this idea of, of overlap is exactly something like this. You know, how are things bending? It's almost like a Mobius strip. You know, the Mobius strip. Going back to Escher, it's getting hot in here. <laughs> um, the Mobius strip of like Escher, well, I think Mobius was a mathematician or geometrist. Or geometer. Someone that does geometry is a geometer. <laughs> um, I've had some friends that were that. I have a good friend of mine, Vinny, who is uh, really into geometry. And um, he's somebody that, uh, you know, I've, I've, he's explained some things to me before. Um, which, which are things like where he'll take algebra uh, concepts from algebra and relate them to geometry. And you're like, what? Like this algebraic equation is really an expression of a geometric progression or something. You know, it's like, sheesh. <laughs> um, and I'm just saying that I could never explain it. Well, I could explain it, but it would just take me a long time. And I would rather do this. Um, so now I've sort of made a kind of a slide happening where it's like a piece of candy or a piece of ribbon that's bending in space here. Um, and I'm just, I don't know what this is gonna be. You know, I don't. Um, and, and there's something totally freeing in the fact that it doesn't have to be a thing. Uh, it doesn't, you can just experiment with creating that sense of space. I mean, I'm using some surface lines here. Um, I'm using some overlap back here. I'm, I'm finding some shading and some more surface lines here. So it's sort of really uh, articulates almost like a, that looks like a piece of cloth that's sort of being pulled by a string almost. Like, so imagine this is a string or a hook. Imagine this is some sort of a hook that's pulling. That's pulling that. It kind of looks that way. Isn't it? I'm like this hook, you know what? What I'm using some um, um, foreshortening there, and and I'm and I'm just sort of going in on the hook now. I'm like, oh, I really like this hook idea. And how does that hook? How does that hook look? <laughs> oh, Mr. Mick, you're hilarious. You know you are. Your jokes are just fire all the time. Um, I just saw a thing. I don't know if you saw that with uh, Ed McMillan, who's the guy that made um, Binding of Isaac. He was releasing another game, or a board game, which I think is pretty cool. Um, actually, uh, uh, my fiance, Maria, she. Um, she had a party, a cookie party. She has a cookie party every year because she's really good at baking. And um, she invited a bunch of people and uh, they were into the Binding of Isaac. So, and I just, I just blended that back. The way you could do that is like, what do you do? You have all these tools that I don't have. I'm just using pencil and paper. No, you just take the side of your hand and, and you can blend that back with the side of your hand. Even I can do it there because the iPad will register my my finger, right? So I'm literally using my finger there to kind of rub it back. You could also use paper towel. Just take a paper towel and gently brush it back. As my professor would say, it's, you know, knock the whole thing back. And then you can build it back up again. You knock it back to build it back up. I didn't even think about it that way till just now. And what what is this? This is kind of like, um, it's like a really fancy, I have no idea what fish hooks look like, to be honest. Like I have an idea of like, a fish hook is this, <laughs> right? And then you need a,
you, you, it's something like that, right? That's a fish hook, you know? Um, I have this idea right here that I have made just the fanciest little fish hook that's pulling this ribbon. Um, I would definitely say uh, this, and, and it's funny, I don't really think of myself as being a surrealist um, in, in like the, the art that's influenced me. I don't really think of uh, surrealism in that way. But I definitely think that um, when I'm creating just from my imagination, things tend to look, uh, become kind of surrealistic. This kind of looks like a paintbrush. <laughs> but I'm using bits of, you know, I almost feel like that hook, now it's like becoming something else. But who cares? Part of me goes, it's not a good hook. Boo, boo, boo. It's also not something I am, you know, this, if this ends up being something that I want to print out and hang on the wall, fine. And if it doesn't, then fine. That's fine too. Um, I'm gonna leave that hook there for a minute. I'm leave that whole thing there for a minute. And, uh, I mean, have I been going for a half an hour? I could probably go for the next three hours. <laughs> um, but I won't. I have a print going in the other room I should check on. Uh, but let me let me do something with with this. So this moving here, moving back behind here and coming out there. You know, I kind of feel like there's a nice kind of an overlap that's happening there. You know, like, I kind of feel like that, that ribbon that's being pulled through is, uh, well, it's in front of whatever that is. Now that to me looks like some sort of a snake or a lizard, but it could also be a piece. It could be a, it could be a, um, well, we could also, um, well, I could look at it from a different angle. It looks like a worm now to me. I, I think, you know, I think my drawings from back in high school used to feature like a worm kind of <laughs> creature a lot, very often. And I think it's something that I've, I've done with my students. Um, where you do something like this. And then this becomes like a worm kind of a thing like a piece of ribbon all of a sudden, like like a worm is kind of like a ribbon animal. It's not an animal, Mr. Mick, it's a bug. Is it a bug? I don't know. Well, now, now there's, now there's, and this, these are great for surface lines and stuff. I mean, look at all the surface lines and overlap and stuff you can find in that. Um, and I'm just gonna, you know what, I'm just gonna brush that back. I'm gonna leave that there. Uh, I'm not deleting it, I'm not erasing it, but you know, I want to look at this, you know, and I, I sort of have to, like, let myself sit with it. Like, a part of me wants to force it. Be like, I like parts of this. Like, come on, come on, come on. Make it a thing. Make it a thing. And I'm like, nah, let's just take our time. You know, part of me also sees a kind of a, of a, like, we could do something like this. And very snake-like, right? Because this thing could kind of be, it could be a snake that's like coming out of something, right? And I'm sure those of you that are home that see this eventually, you are probably looking at this and going, don't you see the... And you're probably right. I, there's things that are probably obvious. Like that looks like a face. That looks like a this or that, you know? And and if you now, and, and look at what happens here. This is going back through and then maybe I can find, you know, coming out this way, maybe I can find that, that snake moving through, right? And I can even brush this back a little bit and then really come forward with that, you know, 
And is it a snake? I can make it into a train. It could be a train. Um, I never thought about how a, how a train is kind of like a snake. That's like... I haven't even thought about that. Isn't that weird? Does that, has anyone else thought about that? A train is like a, is like a human-made snake slithering across, <laughs> across the country. Oh, that's funny. Um... And then I would also probably find sympathetic lines. Like this is sympathetic to this, right? But what happens when you extend it and you, you line, how it lines into there? Um, this kind of is sympathetic to that, right? So I might just start connecting some of those things that, that um, like this goes through there and then maybe it, touches that thing up there right so now this this thing is starting to just evolve and uh, once you get a few things going that you kind of enjoy like the puzzle piece with the piece missing but it's there and you know this kind of weird thing that's going on down here and and this kind of snake thing that's coming back through um, it's just it starts to become a kind of a thing. It starts to become like, why did my mind choose snake? Well, that probably might have been obvious to everybody. Um, I also seen that puzzle piece like someone kind of like in pain. <laughs> it's kind of like a face and a mouth, an eye and a mouth, right? It's kind of like a person in pain. Um, so what is this? What does it become? It's just an exercise. It's an exercise uh, in how to keep yourself entertained. It's an exercise in applying the elements of perspective. If you go back to my earlier videos, you'll see um, I do different drawing examples that uh, um, from McIntyre's book. Um, but this is definitely very much influenced by um, <clears throat> Bruce McIntyre and Walt Stanchfield and the elements of perspective um, in the sense of how I'm approaching drawing. Uh, but, and it, it to keep going, you know, and, and it, it should keep going. I, I should just keep going. <laughs> um, but no, I, I think I am going to call it at the end of the stream here. And um, um, this is something that you could work on a little bit every day. It's something where you can make a new one every day. Um, just see where your imagination goes. Maybe you'll find repetitive themes. Maybe you'll find a repetitive theme of a, of a puzzle piece or of a snake or a, a faces. You keep finding faces and maybe the faces look like certain certain types of certain people. You know, certain people in your life or who knows, you know. I, I am, um, I am uh, a skeptic, but I'm also not, um, I do believe that uh, you know, we know things, things, things enter into consciousness. Now it's getting a little philosophical here. I have no idea why it went this way, but it's almost like there's ideas. Cause I used to read a lot of Plato and stuff. Um, the dialogues of Plato. <clears throat> and I want to say there was a thinker. I can't remember who it was that used to have this idea of like, you can start, and it might've been Shelley. Percy Shelley wrote something called a, um, a defense of poetry. And he talks about um, he talks about the way people the, the poets take the ideas of the society and they put it into word form, and by putting it into word form, they are creating a roadmap to that idea for other people, right? That's what information is, isn't it? It's sharing information is sharing roadmaps with other people to go to the places that you've been. I, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> it's getting really out there. But um, Shelley had this idea that uh, people might not even be fully conscious of the ideas that are influencing them. They, but they might still act as if they believed it or act as if they were influenced by them. Um, <clears throat> So, so maybe um, in just letting your 
the creativity flow and your imagination flow and then giving it shape using things like the elements of perspective and articulating it, maybe you'll hit upon some ideas and some things that are bubbling to the surface for you that you otherwise didn't think about and didn't know. Um, what kind of art class and drawing class is this? Is this a philosophy class? I think those subjects all lead and bleed right into each other and there's no clear division lines. When you look at the work of M.C. Escher, there's a great documentary you can find on YouTube about Escher and how um, his ideas influence different scientists. <laughs> Um, and ideas about how the universe itself works. Um, and I, I think Escher, and, and there's another great surrealist, uh, Magritte, uh, Rene Magritte. Um, Magritte had this idea of, um, I, I probably spelled that wrong. Did I spell it right? Oh, uh, I hope I spelled it right. Look how proud I am of myself. I'm an art teacher. <laughs> um, but Magritte's uh, the treachery of images, right? Uh, Magritte was an amazing painter. I mean, look at that rendering of a pipe. Um, that is a really well-rendered pipe. He writes very neatly underneath, uh, from what I understand, this is not a pipe. <laughs> And you're like, wait a minute, no, it's a pipe. No, it's not. It's a painting of a pipe. It's paint on canvas. And Magritte was pointing out that we are so visually dominant that we believe what we see. Seeing is believing, right? But our vision, we, we might see things and, and think about how many... Um, like stories and stuff that we have where somebody sees something and they, they interpret what they see to be one thing when it's really not that thing. Um, but they act as if that thing really happened because they're interpreting it and they're making assumptions about it. Um, and the assumptions that they make l end up putting them on a pathway to, you know, I mean, if, if just thinking about Shakespeare, think about Othello. You know, what, what does Iago do other than put clues in front of Othello that trick Othello into believing that Desdemona is really being unfaithful when in reality um, he's just so caught up in believing what he sees and his brain is filling in the narrative, right? Um, and our brains do that, you know, our brains fill in the narrative, our brains... Uh, <clears throat> make a story out of seemingly nothing or interpret things and and um, you have to be careful about that uh, because you can end up um, believing things based on whatever anyway I, 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 I digress um, how does this relate back to Magritte and Escher is that they were um, telling us that uh, yeah you know, vision is an amazing thing. It is. And, and seeing in some ways is believing. But at the same time, don't believe everything that you see. And also, what you may have thought you are seeing isn't actually truth, the truth. So you have to dig deeper than what you see. You have to dig deeper than what your mind is telling you. You have to dig deeper. Your mind interprets the images, gives them meaning. And sometimes it's the meaning it gives it is not true. That is not a pipe. It's not. Escher's amazing uh, illusion is that. It's not just that it is an illusion. It's that the drawing itself is an illusion. The images on a paper are an illusion themselves. As you stare at a flat screen right now and watch this, your brain is giving these shapes and sounds meaning. Um, but just because it seems to make sense doesn't make it true. 
And just because it seems to look like a pipe doesn't mean it is. So, the words of wisdom from Magritte and Asher. <laughs> um, and I'm going to keep doodling on this. I think maybe this will be, you know, the rest of the week. I'll keep doodling on this every day a little bit. And um, maybe I'll check back in later in the week with you guys and maybe doing another uh, drawing, a couple drawing examples and lessons from McIntyre's book. Um, because I think uh, I, I always learn a lot from it. Um, even going back to things that I've done many, many times for years now. Um, I think it's just such a rich resource. And um, it's the tools that you need to lean on. You know, it's, it's understanding how, how to create the illusion of visual space on a two-dimensional surface. That's the elements of perspective. So thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm going to get back and see how that 3D print is going that I was working on. Samira, if you're watching this, um, I think I might be in the home stretch. Or I have it printing, and if you want to get it printing well, it'll be up to you. <laughs> All right. See you guys. Oh, no, you're still here. I said goodbye. <laughs> see ya.